Um, seeing that's a very small group here, I would, I would really uh, encourage anybody, if you have any questions with anything I say or just questions with and wants a little bit more detail, feel free to jump in, interrupt me, and uh, we have an opportunity here where uh, you don't need to keep it to the end with this few people, okay? So, um, anyway, I'll just get started here and talk a little bit about, I guess, uh, um, my background. Obviously, you, you heard I came from the cement industry. And there's one thing that the cement industry is good at, and it's, uh, it's producing their second most manufactured product, which is uh, greenhouse gas. So, roughly in the province of Ontario, an average of, and this is a, uh, this is a real average used in the uh, provincial cap and trade regulations, 803 kilograms of CO2 is produced for every 1,000 kilograms of cement made in the province. So that's an average of the, uh, the four great cement manufacturers in the province. So that uh, means there's going to be some people who are above that and some that are below that. 803 is the average for using a 2012 baseline, which was used in the regulation for cap and trade. Compare that against, um, you know, say, steel industry, where you know, depending on the type of steel, so the steel that's made here in the province of Ontario is roughly around 1.3 to 1.7 tons of CO2 for every ton of steel made. So what you start to see is that the, the, the two of the biggest infrastructure uh, sectors that are responsible for building everything that you know, it, like everything, I mean, like the floor we're standing on, the roads you're driving on, 401, although it's a, it's a, it looks like a asphalt, it's, it's, a, it's a concrete highway underneath six inches of blacktop. So that, uh, that concrete highway is running from Detroit to, uh, to Montreal. All of that is all concrete. And, uh, and steel reinforced as well, so all the steel reinforcements and bridges. So when you start putting that into perspective, that's a huge amount of infrastructure and a huge amount of greenhouse gas. And when you start doing the averages of it, you're looking at an almost one to one ratio. So you're looking at roughly one ton of CO2 goes into the air for every one ton of building materials consumed on the planet. When you start adding other things into it and start saying, okay, well, we could start using lumber and trees. If you're, if you're doing anything besides um, farmed lumber, you're now also cutting down trees that are a CO2 sink that would be otherwise metabolizing the CO2. So there's all sorts of pros and cons to everything. So one of the things I hope to touch on a little bit today is the, uh, all the different types of technologies that we are currently working with, um, with various companies. And if we're not working with them yet, we're working with academic institutions that are developing some of these technologies that I'm going to talk about today and some of them are really exciting because there's a lot of opportunity for, as I said before, to make a lot of money doing things that are going to be right for the environment and the planet and, and all of the uh, social sustainability that we are uh, trying to achieve. So, first just a little bit about the Ontario Centers of Excellence. I don't know if anybody's heard of the OCD before, but the Ontario Centers of Excellence is basically a uh, uh, Ignore that a little bit. I'm sure our communications team would, would really start cringing right now if I said just ignore that for a second. But really, we we help the Ministry of Research and Innovation as well as a few other ministries spend their money in a way that uh, is sort of arm's length and third party validation and verified. Very often, um, government doesn't have the capabilities to uh, to reach out and work directly with a um, an industry or doesn't have the, the the people that can reach out to academic institutions and do the due diligence. So that money is just not being sprayed around. So that's sort of you know in a nutshell the, the quick and dirty of what we do. But we certainly are very active in uh, in helping the province uh, drive innovation and uh, economic development uh, in areas of innovative new uh, technologies. So the target GHG program, let's touch on this very briefly, but this is a program that is um, started last year and was based on a $325 million green investment uh, fund of which we received $74 million to uh, work at the first kick of the can of uh, greenhouse gas stuff. Now the, the greenhouse gas program, the cap and trade, started January 1st of this year. So this is coming from legacy funds and not so much the funds that were generated this year, which I'll get, uh, which I'll get into a little bit of detail on. But in a nutshell, it was uh, $39 million for uh, the Stream 1, which is big in industrial demonstrations, which is where I will concentrate most of my discussion today on uh, collaborative development that is working with Sustainable Development Technologies Canada and NSERC. So that's looking at, um, NSERC would be dealing with uh, projects more as an academic institution, and the SDTC would be those that are basically getting inside the lab for the first time, trying to build that first pilot. 
So that's sort of the scales there, whereas the stream one is looking at the big, big boys who are trying to put in big projects and serious capex in the millions of dollars. So this is looking at 50% um, of a project's cost up to a uh, ask of uh, $5 million from the province. So in order to get the $5 million, you would have to have a project that's $10 million or greater. And uh, announcements are going to be coming in soon to talk about how we spent that money. So that's all in the contract phase right now. And we are looking at subsequent funding and opportunities with the province, which I'll get into uh, in a bit. And I think there's, we've seen a lot of um, a lot of uh, interesting things starting to come about. We saw uh, you know, the province um, um, ramping up things like thermostats for houses and stuff like that. So there's a bit of a lag between collecting the money over the year and finally getting it to dispersing it. I think we're going to start seeing some really good things come from that. And then stream three is um, support for uh, a Solutions 2030 uh, program that we're running, which uh, just closed recently, and that is basically uh, a global call for um, innovations around the world that can do sort of uh, cross-sectoral innovations that can reduce <coughs> gas emissions in, in almost any way. So we're sort of reviewing that. We've received almost 200 um, applications, which we have to eventually start to whittle down to 20 or less. So that'll, uh, that'll come down again. Um, part of that also is supporting the Carbon X Prize semifinalists. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Carbon X Prize. I'll get into that a little bit more. But uh, there were three semifinalists in Ontario who got to split a $2.5 million purse towards um, their, their Carbon X Prize uh, competition. So just for those of you who have heard a lot about cap and trade, and there's there's always an interesting article in the newspaper over what's better, carbon tax, cap and trade, or nothing at all. And uh, this, this will be a little bit on just specifically how cap and trade works from a from an industrial perspective. And um, hopefully it clears up some things, but happy to take some questions on this. Set, but it's set as the highest of an average between California and Quebec. And now that Ontario's in that, it will also join that sort of spot market to set prices as a floor price. And then the, the market continues. Now, the people who will go into the auction will be trading, and the latest auction prices are floating around between 1856 and 1872 a ton. So, March 22nd's auction raised 473 million, followed by 504 million. September's 526 million. And uh, November 29th is still to happen. So what we have here is about $1.5 billion sitting in a bank account that by law has to go towards um, greenhouse gas reduction projects of some kind. Okay, so they cannot go, in, they, even though it's in sort of the government's pocket, it's, they're not allowed to say spend it on you know, improving the, uh, the roads and sidewalks outside. It has to go towards actually making a, a difference in reducing emissions. So that, uh, from that side is good, but You've got this concern now where how do you prevent this sort of action where you're just firing money into the air and, and prevent it from you know uh, just going into anything. And that's where Ontario Centers of Excellence does a lot of the due diligence for the government to make sure that these industrial projects are, are um, proceeding at a pace that uh, is agreed to in a contract that we have with them. 
So it's uh, none of the money that goes out from this program is given to anybody as a, here's the cash. It's uh, you, you construct $100,000 worth of equipment, you show us the invoice and the construction, and then we'll give you 50% of that back, which can go towards the next phase of the project when we follow those milestones. So that, yeah. So, so then what is it per ton that you're paying? So you, you, if people are paying 18 for the credits, and from the investment side, what are you paying for those tons? Great question. So the way that it works out, so there is a capital cost and an operational cost. Most of the things of the operational costs, businesses aren't doing it if they're going to have a negative operational cost and it's going to kill them. Okay? So we make sure of that. So we can't get into projects that are going to go underwater instantly. Otherwise, you're, you're throwing money away. So th there has to be a sound business plan that's fully reviewed, and it takes about six months of due diligence to do these. But what you do is you look at also the length of capital. So we were, the length of capital, capital is typically 20 to 25 years for most of this heavy equipment. We're talking very big, heavy equipment that's going into these projects that I'll, that I'll talk about. But we brought it down to basically 11 years, between now and 2030. So by, by the time these projects complete, the average date of all the contracts that we signed and 2030, which is the end of the so-called agreement between California, Quebec, and Ontario, that has been signed thus far. So there, there is discussion about what's going to happen post-2030, but we only use what's been signed so far by the three jurisdictions. And so when you divide all of the capital costs by 11, which is conservative, considering the equipment will last longer, and it's in the company's best interest to continue making money off of this capital, then um, the typical average costs there are vary between projects from a dollar and change a ton to about $11 a ton uh, in uh, reductions. So very good question and that's one of the things that we look at from a uh, perspective of uh, trying to keep that average in as a good investment for the province. Um, in some cases it is higher than 18. Sometimes we've seen costs go to 20, 25, 30. But we know that there is an escalation in what the carbon price is expected to be, especially with the federal backstop around $25 a ton by 20, uh, 2022, I think, even. So when you start looking at those federal backstops, we also look at some of these projects as strategic. And so even though they might be a little bit smaller, we see them as strategic that add to like building blocks to other technologies to open the door. And I'll talk a little bit about that. One of those is hydrogen production, which hydrogen is a very, very interesting uh, building block in greenhouse gas production. So then the question is, what technologies and where do you go from here? So one of the, you know, not to be too cliche, and you know, and, and I, I love those, you know, people plan to profit things, but I also love conserve, convert, and combine is what are the three sorts of things you can do with, with CO2 and greenhouse gases. And it's not just CO2 as a greenhouse gas, right? There's methane, there's a, there's a desflorane, there's all sorts of um, volatile organic compounds that, um, that act as uh, greenhouse gases that I'll touch on a little bit here. But in some of these, um, especially the last two, convert and combine, are often done at the same time. And, uh, and conserve tends to be putting out less CO2. But as, I, as you'll see, sometimes if you can make money from CO2, you want to put out less. And that becomes the, the interesting thing on the business argument, is that if you can make money from CO2 by combining it or converting it into something else and adding value to it, then why does one want to make less? So it creates that sort of conundrum in, in typical thought, right? Um, produce more to make more profit. So one of the examples on the conserve sort of thing is when you cement, lime, and steel, um, all of the cement companies in the province and um, a couple of the biggest steel companies in the province are all working with things like biomass and are utilizing waste biomass that is currently going towards landfill sites. So nobody's talking about uh, getting permits to cut down trees. It's all, this is a construction demolition, wood waste, that stuff like this that thousands and thousands of tons every day are just going into landfill sites. Okay? And that uh, decomposes into methane gas. And even if you were to capture the methane gas, methane gas is a, a CO2 equivalent of about 25, so it's about 25 times worse than CO2 as a, as a greenhouse gas. But if you are, um, if, even if you capture it and turn it into whatever, capture that landfill gas, which I'll talk a little bit about as well, the best case scenario worldwide is about 80% capture. 
So if you consider that 20% is still being wasted, but 20% is 25 times worse than CO2, you can see that the, the numbers don't add up to equivalence on the 80%. So um, this is very interesting because this has, between cement, lime, and steel, three of the biggest industries that are emitting some of the highest amounts of greenhouse gas. If they do just a little bit, it's equivalent to almost everybody else doing significant amounts. So it's, a, it's quite an interesting um, group that's uh, working with this. The problem on the innovation side isn't replacing biomass or coal with biomass. That's, anybody can do that. But how do you do it? at the volumes that these monster facilities require. Okay, so if I look here, here's a picture of my alma mater. I used to work for St. Mary's Cement. Um, that cement plant is consuming about 32 tons of coal every hour. Okay, that's every single hour. It puts out roughly 5,000, yeah, 5, 4,800 tons of CO2 every day. Okay, as a result of its cement manufacturing. So now the question is, how do you substitute that volume of, uh, of wood waste in a way that is sustainable, can be delivered, doesn't drive the neighbors crazy with truckload after truckload after truckload coming in? You have to try to find supply chains that work, as well as it has to be uniform and not impact product quality. They can't go building a bridge that is the first half is 40 megapascal strength and the second half is 30 megapascal strength and then you end up having a, a, a collapse of a bridge. So there's all sorts of complexities and the same goes for steel. Same for lime. <clears throat> Other just simple things are uh, energy conservation and management. Just simply managing your systems better, using better use of the fuels and energy that you use. Uh, modernizing a boiler, mo modernizing a um, electrical system, putting variable speed drives on it. Yeah. Well, um, the one thing you're going back to fuel. Um, the only company. Uh, in Ontario that is licensed to burn waste solvents is wholesome. Yep. And we, uh, I, I'm, I, I've been working in the waste industry for 38 years. Mm. And I do a lot of work for several cement plants. And so Ontario exports quite a bit of waste solvent and paint mm. to Synthath Corporation in Michigan, where they burn it to make fuel at the cement plants. And in Ontario, uh, there's only one company that does that. And how I actually originally got involved in with the cement industry was uh, one of my customers that I still do business with was burning their own waste. They got nailed by the Ministry of Environment. That waste gets shipped off site, uh, some of the heavier fuels, because it's less uh, economical to, uh, to, to fuel blend it get solidified and go to landfill. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the problems with that industry is NIMBYs, like not my backyard, uh, getting I, I take it a step certificates further. of approval to yeah. do that. And the cement industry in Ontario was permitted to burn waste. There'd be quite a uh, cost savings to them, cost savings to general industry in Ontario that wouldn't have to export their solvents to the state, but you know, I throw that in. I, I agree 100%. Certainly, that um, that was my biggest file was getting permits in for the cement industry for this because of what I take it past NIMBYism. I call it the banana concept. Burn absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone, and there's a there's a fear of you know just incineration and the it's not so much that. Um, you know, people should or shouldn't be afraid of incineration, but they think that burning of any kind is incineration. And the difference in when you're manufacturing a product like cement is the temperatures at a cement plant are almost three times the temperature of what you would find in an incinerator. You're, you're pushing flame temperatures of over 2,000 degrees Celsius, material and gas temperatures around 1,450 degrees Celsius. So you're destroying compounds into bare elemental oxides. And then due to the fact that um, toxins like dioxins and furans form our, our recombination chemicals in the downstream flue gases. In a cement plant, unlike, uh, unlike many incinerators, modern incinerators are better, but a uh, cement plant is recapturing all of the heat in the exhaust by throwing limestone powder, the raw feed that makes cement, they throw that into the raw, into the exhaust gases, and it quenches the exhaust gases so quickly 
that you don't get a recombination effect of dioxins and furans forming at around 400 degrees Celsius. So those sorts of things are looked after, but that explanation would have just glazed over everybody's eyes as Joe Voter. And so when a, when, a, when a politician is permitting and regulating, their job is to get reelected, not to give a permits to cement land. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, getting into sort of things that are beyond methane and stuff like that, one of the, one, there's a couple of interesting companies that are capturing um, halogen, halogenated drug recovery, so HDRs. And the, one of the most common modern um, uh, drug out right there for, uh, if you have a procedure done with this flooring, but it, it's a 100 year greenhouse gas coefficient is 1,526 times worse than CO2. Laughing gas is 296 times, and then you have isofluorine, subfluorine. These are massive numbers, so you release just a little bit, and, um, and it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's far worse than CO2. So these uh, companies now are working in Ontario, they're waiting on Health Canada approval, but um, at some point in the future, these companies that are working on this will be able to recycle the drug. They're already recycling it, stockpiling it, waiting for approval to do something with it. And, um, but it's it just, nobody's thought of the concept of recycling a drug. The reality is, is you breathe the drug in and you exhale it, and then it's vented. So now they're capturing it, storing it, purifying it again, because it is just a hydrocarbon, and they can purify it and then hopefully reuse it again. And this stuff's about six to $800 a liter, so it's, um, it's, it's well worth the economics of uh, chasing it. But unfortunately, this is where, again, a lot of regulation helps, and uh, right now this is regulation that sort of stands in the way that we're trying to, uh, to work on. So one of the things I like to talk about a lot is what is the real difference between waste and a product, and without being too cliche here, um, value is the main difference, right? So if, if you add value to a waste, is it really a waste anymore? And so that's the thing, that's the challenge in the regulations, as you say, you can add, you can add value to it by using it as a fuel, but the regulations in Ontario have um, traditionally been once a waste, always a waste. And uh, I've said for a long time, the, uh, the landfills of today are the mines of tomorrow. You have an opportunity to tap into huge amounts of purified and refined resources that have been thrown away for years. Yeah. One more comment is uh, in the regulation, uh, like waste can be, let's say hazardous waste can be exempt from being waste if it's recycled, except if it's used, uh, in a, except if it's burnt. Right. So if it, if it goes for energy from waste, it's no longer considered recycled. But I could give, like if I've got a liter of paint and somebody wants a liter of paint, I can give it to them. Mm -hmm. But if it's going for disposal or for fuel, it's a waste. And so the, the legislation is one of the whole thing. Sure. And there's some interesting twists to that legislation as well, where there are many cases where um, the buyers of a waste that is deemed to be hazardous, and I say deemed, not actually hazardous. So if you have a waste product from the manufacturing of a hazardous substance, then the waste, even though not hazardous, is declared hazardous in the province of Ontario. Interestingly, the same in New York State. What's interesting, though, is that when that material crosses the border into New York State from Ontario or from Quebec, the state of New York says, we don't trust you Canadians. We're going to test it ourselves. They test it. It passes because it's not hazardous in the first place, and they let it in, and it can be used as a raw material or fuel. The same thing happens to stuff that's produced in New York and Michigan. Ontario stops it at the border and says, well, we don't believe you Americans. So they test it, find out it's not hazardous and uh, then suddenly it's allowed to be used here. So it's kind of a, a crazy thing that happens that we can't use our own resources here. We end up sending them elsewhere to the competitive disadvantage of our own industry. So here just a little bit on um, some of the other technologies that we're working on. Uh, obviously it's the Carbon X Prize, the three um, companies that um, made it to semi-finalist days are CERT. And that's uh, that's developed a uh, technology developed at the University of Toronto, and that's using electrocatalytic conversion of CO2 into formic acid. Formic acid is a building block for a huge array of chemicals, especially a precursor to making things like methanol. And methanol is a precursor to about 30% of the world's chemicals. Uh, 
what kind of technical is uh, CO2 conversion into industrial minerals. So that has a huge opportunity from the perspective of um, doing massive volumes at uh, relatively low value, but massive volumes of material. And then there's Pond Technologies, which has the capability to do lower volumes, but at massive uh, value. So some of the um, nutraceutical pharmaceutical products are, are valued from about $2,000 a ton to as high as $3,000 a kilogram. So we start uh, talking about the different types of algae and stuff that Pond Technologies can, uh, has been working on. And they've been working on, uh, on that moment in the next slide. So this is another uh, company, Carbon Cure. And when I was talking to you before about uh, building materials, about, well, after water, concrete is the most consumed substance on the planet by man. Okay, about 300 kilograms for every, every year for every man, woman, and child on the planet. Every year is consumed. Okay, so that's a massive amount of product. So what the carbon cure actually does is they, you know, for, and I don't want to, uh, to downplay it, but what they do is they basically um, carbonize and carbonate the water uh, that goes into the concrete for the concrete making process and then once it's reacting with the, the products and chemical reactions in the cement and in the silicates it starts to form micro nanoparticles of limestone again inside now very very little amount so it doesn't it's a, it's a very low volume but what it does is it enhances the strength to the point where you can reduce the amount of cement required in a cubic meter of concrete and that's where the real savings are so you can reduce it maybe two to five percent. They have some higher claims. I tend to, even if I use it conservatively, if you say two to five percent less cement on the most consumed sub, uh, uh, building material substance on the planet, that becomes quite significant. So they're uh, they're an expert semifinalist out of, out of um, Halifax that is uh, doing some work here in the province of Ontario with uh, basically all the cement companies. Um, Bond Technology is working with the National Research Council in Canada to try to find high value products out of algae. And that's another very interesting pro uh, process. They're working again with my old uh, alma mater at St. Mary's Cement here. And uh, that's one of the bioreactors that they have there that grows algae at a ridiculous rate. And one of the interesting things about this is some of the spin-off intellectual property, like um, they make their own LEDs from scratch. And uh, they have hands down the world's most powerful LEDs at uh, some of them at 6,000 watts. So if you start thinking that a 60 watt incandescent light bulb can re be replaced by a 13 watt compact fluorescent light, which has the same amount of lumens as a four watt LED. So now picture a high efficiency 6,000 watt LED, and it's uh, pretty much not eye safe at any distance. So it's uh, unbelievably uh, bright. We actually had one of the one of the LEDs running at about three percent output under a cardboard box in a room surrounded by welding glass, and it was still a very annoying room to be in. So, pretty interesting stuff. Um, so anaerobic digestion is a big technology that's coming here. Now, there are a few companies in this space, and unfortunately, there are some cases where I can't discuss the the names of the companies just because we're in the middle of contractual phases and, and stuff like that. But the anaerobic digestion is taking things like it can be uh, sewage sludge, in this case, it's agricultural wastes, and again, this is uh, that making value out of waste. So these sorts of things would typically have decomposed into methane gas at 25 times the greenhouse gas coefficient of, uh, of CO2. But here, we can capture that gas, remove the hydrogen sulfide, which is another company that we've, uh, we've worked with um, that, uh, that, re that removes the uh, H2S from the gas and brings it to uh, pipeline quality natural gas. And so with a renewable natural gas standard, all of the gas companies are being um, required by law to increase the amount of renewable natural gas into their pipeline. So they're all partners in these types of projects going forward. And then certainly the um, you know, other, other versions of the exact same thing. So rather than doing it through letting little microbes do your digestion, you can heat it up, starting with say, either electricity or, or natural gas or hydrogen or whatever heat source you want. If you heat up something in completely hydrocarbons in the absolute absence of oxygen, then you have gas phase reduction, where you basically heat it up until the, uh, it breaks down elementally and starts to vaporize. You can start pulling out the hydrogen and start pulling out the uh, methane gas. The, the carbon goes off as carbon black as opposed to CO2. And then once you start producing enough hydrogen and, um, and methane, you can combust that out of the, uh, out of the materials, that, uh, out of the biomass that you're cooking. 
and then replace the natural gas that you use to start the system up. And then it bleeds excess amounts because it, use, it produces more hydrocarbon gas than it requires to keep the reaction going. So interesting technologies that are, uh, that are also, um, I guess, competing, I guess, with conventional uh, anaerobic digestion. And then landfill gas, as I discussed before. There's an interesting project right now that is taking landfill gas and uh, capturing that and then sending it to an industrial neighbor to fire a combined heat and power plant that uh, will provide all the electricity for the facility and then the waste heat will be providing all the heat for the plant to uh, for, for basic comfort. So very interesting project. And um, when you're just speaking about garbage, here's an example of a garbage company that is fueling all of its vehicles with compressed natural gas. You take that a step further and if you're, if you're also an operator of a landfill site, you can now start fueling your vehicles with renewable natural gas. And so that's, uh, that's sort of the next step that a lot of garbage companies are tending to take. And, and, oh, and just, just before I go, leave that slide. Think of it from a business perspective. Every municipality in Ontario is also trying to uh, justify why they should maintain their contract with that municipality. So the garbage company is maintaining the contract. Municipalities are trying to lower their greenhouse gas footprint. If you now have a fleet of garbage trucks that is running on renewable natural gas, does that ever a leg up against the competition? It does not. It becomes very difficult for an elected group of municipalities to then say, we would prefer to go with the dirtier truck company. So interesting business models that can arise from this that are more so than just the, the fuel pumps. Yeah. What's the uh, what would be the starting capacity you would need for a fleet like that? Like I look at that, then you look at a lot loss, you look at Excel management that runs Walmart. So what's what's the starting level you really need for you need okay, so the starting standpoint I would say is like you yeah, a dozen trucks that come home every night. Really? And, and, and you could be into it. So you see a lot of that with uh, ready-mix concrete plants, especially in the greater Chicago area, are doing this more and more. Because uh, most of these vehicles are fueled to not fuel up again until they get back home to base. So it's the perfect opportunity to plug into a compressed natural gas rather than liquid natural gas because they can fuel up all night. Fueling with uh, CNG or RNG does take quite a bit of time. So it's perfect for those vehicles that come home to base. So anybody like a FedEx, a UPS, a school buses. Yeah. So getting into fuels, one of the challenges with all fuels is what is the energy density? And this is one of the most important things because a lot of people right away say, hey, let's just start making hydrogen everything. Hydrogen is so light that it's a fantastic fuel, but it takes up three times the space per gigajoule that, uh, that gasoline takes, which means on a gigajoule basis, gigajoules translates directly into the watts and horsepower of that engine that's running it. So if you want to go so many, uh, so many miles down the road, you're going to need X amount of gigajoules, all things being equal. So you, are, you give up space. Now that's not to say hydrogen doesn't have its place, but it, it just poses a different challenge, which means you just can't compare apples to apples on when you're doing things. It's the same weight, but not the same volume. So when you start looking at uh, fuel cells, there's a, a, a fuel cell aspect of not just combusting it, but you actually get better fuel efficiency if you uh, electrify the, uh, the hydrogen rather than combust it and, and go to a fuel cell. But hydrogenation of CO2 is, the, is sort of the next really, really big thing that's coming along. And when you look at that, there's you can make methanol through an off-the-shelf Fischer-Trope system. You can literally just go buy a Fischer-Trope reactor and start manufacturing your own methanol. The problem is you need hydrogen. Hydrogen is basically, you know, um, you, you have to attach it chemically through a reactor to your CO2 and you create your methanol. You attach two uh, methanols together and you get dimethyl ether. Dimethyl ether is interesting because dimethyl ether can burn with very minimal um, uh, changes to a diesel engine. Okay, so the, it all changes the fuel system. Dimethyl ether is a liquid at room temperature, but starts to boil off at about 21 degrees Celsius. So yeah, as the room temperature starts to volatilize. But that said, it'll burn nicely in a diesel engine without having lubricity problems, uh, uh, creating lubrication issues. That diesel fuel is always great as a lubricant as well. Dimethyl ether doesn't necessarily act too much like a solvent that would uh, counteract the, the lubrication systems of the engine itself. So that's a very interesting thing, and I'll get into a little bit more of that, but one of the latest 
greatest is direct catalysis to gasoline. And that becomes an interesting thing on many levels because even though it's a fairly new technology, if you can get hydrogen cheap, that's the big question. Where do you get the hydrogen? But if you can get hydrogen cheaply and you can get it competitively, there are technologies now where you can go directly to gasoline as, uh, from, um, from CO2 by, by assembling the hydrocarbon properly. Now that becomes very, very interesting on many levels because one of the challenges to, uh, to any politician is that garbage truck fleets don't vote, companies don't vote, but the guy who drives his car every day to work is the one who votes. So finding solutions for people who are otherwise driving um, is a good thing. Now, you will be releasing CO2 emissions when you drive that synthesized gasoline, but you can make the synthesized gasoline from the emissions of a smokestack from a large industrial facility. And if you look at, say, just a couple of steel plants in Hamilton, you're, lo you're looking at roughly 8 million tons a year of CO2. If you start attaching hydrogen to all of that, you have a lot of gasoline that theoretically could be made, provided you have a source of hydrogen. So everybody says, well, we've got electric cars coming. That's the energy density of a lithium-ion battery, unfortunately. So if you compare it to all the others, it's, it's the best we've got. Unfortunately, that's one of, the, one of the challenges that we're working on. So how do we keep improving the range based on the, the amount of energy that you can store in a lithium-ion battery? Now, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar, this is a Tesla battery pack. This Tesla battery pack, you can literally see the head of each and every single one of these lithium-18650 battery cells. They're roughly the same size as a AA battery, and they're the best battery that we have right now today, and that's why Tesla has uh, soldered thousands and thousands of them together to make these battery cells, battery packs for the Tesla. So unfortunately, that's the, uh, and, that, and so if you're wondering, that's why you know Tesla costs so much, because it's, it's a lot of uh, batteries, yeah? Um, can, for the, the previous uh, previous plots that you had, uh, what was the, what were the two variables that were being compared? So megajoules per liter versus megajoules per kilogram. Oh. Okay. I just missed that this part of the intro. I was confused as why the three batteries were so. So the ultimate really is to be on the y equals x, if you want your ultimate curve. Okay? Because it doesn't matter how many of these batteries you charge, you're never going to get that to fly and that to float. You know what I mean? So that's the challenge. How do we tackle the real big, big, bigs? And that's where I get into the dimethyl ether. Yeah? Is the, pro but is the problem with the battery simply its range or also the fact that it's so carbon intense, carbon? Carbon dioxide to I'm not even touching the life cycle analysis. That's, that, that is a good question, and that is something that's a, another hour lecture for sure. Okay, but, um, but yeah, but I'm just talking about the weight of the battery versus the amount of kilowatts in it, it means you'll never get that, that baby off the ground. It's just, it's, you won't even get to the end of the runway. Okay, so that, that becomes the challenge. Here, a lot of people talking about, oh, you can do electric flights and stuff like that. Uh, if, you, if you've seen what um, entire nations have been able to put together, like the, the solar aircraft and, and you know, those long-range stuff by NASA, that's the best we can do right now. Now, I'm not saying we can't get a battery in the future, but everybody thinks that chemical store or uh, um, electrical storage has to be done at its electrons. Electrochemical is probably where we're going to be seeing the greatest amount of advances. So it's um, making hydrogen gas out of, I, I don't want to use the word, uh, free, but let's say spare electricity. You've heard a lot of options where they're exporting Ontario electricity to the U.S. because you can't idle back a nuclear power plant at night when nobody's using the electricity. So they often export this. These are the types of things where you could use those opportunities to produce that things like hydrogen or the hydrogen that goes into dimethyl ether or the hydrogen that goes into gasoline synthesis. You can do those sorts of things and chemically store that excess electricity. And plugging it in with a long extension cord is probably not going to work. So when you start looking at it, the reason we use gasoline and diesel is they sit beautifully on this Y equals X. You just follow this Y equals X and you see all the chemicals that you know as that's why we use them, because the energy density is there and it allows us to get the best bang for the buck. It's always about economic viability. So when you start looking at hydrogen production, the current way to do it that's done all the time is steam methane reforming, and that's basically cracking natural gas. If you have a hydrocarbon, you dump the carbon to the atmosphere, you're left with the hydrogen. 
Okay, so that's that's the way it's typically done, but it produces plenty of CO2, like epic amounts. Okay, now, electrolysis needs low cost and surplus electricity. That's um, that's that's clear. But there are options for that. There are a few um, there are a few little niches that exist uh, that that uh, could produce hydrogen cheaper. And some of those things are you look at um, you know a lot. Of, there's, there's a lot of things like energy from waste facilities and stuff like this that politically people don't want, let's say, in their neighborhood. But if they were doing something good by, say, manufacturing hydrogen gas, then it starts to become, you start to improve the social sustainability license of these types of facilities. That's just as, just as an example. But, um, and then one of the biggest expenses of putting up a windmill isn't as much the windmill, it's connecting it to the grid. It costs about a million dollars per megawatt kilometer, okay, to a, a power line. It's got to bury the power line, and uh, that's about the cost of it. So when you start figuring you've got these wind farms that are all in the middle of nowhere, one of the biggest costs is laying a power line with all those things and, and connecting it to the grid. If you take a windmill that is, and that you could put up, say, on a pipeline, you could start injecting um, uh, things like electrolyzed uh, hydrogen into a pipeline. So, or, or a fueling station that's nearby. So there's all sorts of other types of options that open up, including things like, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of people don't realize, but across the whole Rocky Mountain Range in Canada are radio towers that are carrying uh, cell phone communication by microwave dish as repeater stations going across massive distances. There's no power line between them. They're all running diesel generators with massive fuel tanks that are filled up about every six months by helicopter. Okay, nobody gets this, but this is happening. And so here are opportunities to say, put up a windmill to offset the amount of diesel that would be used remote. So the global roadmap for implementing CO2 utilization, this is a uh, fantastic um, a sort of book. One of the interesting things it talks about is that CO2 utilization at less than 10% of the CO2 that's being produced by industrial facilities in the Western world will become an 800 billion to $1 trillion industry by 2030. So that's what they're predicting already. So this is definitely an interesting space to get into and, and to look at, and that's CO2 utilization. So I provided the website down here too, as well, and um, it's an interesting document. It talks about all the different types of technologies that, uh, that, that, that I've been talking about. But what's interesting is that when the document came out, I thought it was very interesting because we'd already started down that path with uh, many companies that are uh, chasing these sorts of things already. So I think that's a, a good thing. So anyway, that's uh, my presentation. Uh, that's a little bit about the Ontario Centers of Excellence. And then I'd like to invite anybody in additional questions or if you want to back up and talk about anything else. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. So the first one was when we when you mentioned that the companies are auctioning um, are buying the uh, carbon the what do you call it? Allowances. The allowances at eighteen dollars per ton. Um, and then the question came on the return on investment. Was it? Yeah. Um, and you said it like the maximum range that you mentioned was eleven dollars, right? Yeah. So <laughs> so, so no, that's eleven dollars to the province. So the provincial cost. So if you think about it, if the province is, um, has a pool of allowances that they give up to the province and they sell them at $18 a ton, they're theoretically buying them back because companies aren't eating as many. So they're not feeding that econo economic model as much. And the cost to the province to, uh, is, is about $11. Okay. Now, and keep in mind that's not tax money. That's coming from industry in the first place. Okay, so it's a separate thing coming from cap and trade. Now, the, one of the things that uh, you have to be aware of is that in order to be competitive, energy intensive trade exposed sectors are granted free allowances. So cement, lime, and steel as an example, okay? And now also things like um, uh, certain automotive manufacturing facilities. And the reason that is, is that if you take the cost of carbon and add it to $18 a ton into the total cost of, the, of that, product that they export, it would put them at risk from uh, bringing material in from offshore or not being able to sell it in that opposite jurisdiction. One of the things we saw in the cement industry is that the, the cost of making a ton of cement in China was only $4 a ton 
cheap or more expensive than making it in the, on the west coast of North America after shipping. Okay? So high oil prices actually helped the cement industry because it, it raised the prices. But now oil has fallen to half of what it was. And cap and trade prices increased the cost of manufacturing. In, um, in British Columbia, the carbon tax had $72 a ton tax to the cost of burning a ton of coal. So you buy a ton of coal for $100, and then they have to pay a $72 a ton tax on top of that. So it's $172 a ton on something that costs about 25 to 28% of the manufacturing costs. So right away, it could render you uncompetitive. And um, as a result, the British Columbia government has been giving money back to the cement industry in BC because they realized this after the fact, that it's actually decimating the uh, cement industry. So cap and trade offers a, a different alternative method to it. And then the incentive and the penalty is that if you don't get under that 803 kilograms, and every year that drops by about you know, 4.57%, 4 if you don't get under that reduction every year, then you have to find allowances on the open market. So you might get your base load at, uh, for free, but you have to account for the rest of it. And, uh, and because you're dealing with numbers that are huge, absolutely huge numbers of, of tons, it would detrimentally hurt a cement company not to be working on innovations to try to make sure that they're always below that 5% every year. So that's, that's sort of that, that's the incentive of how that works. So even though it sounds like they're getting a break, what you, the, the worst thing that you can have happen by any sort of policy is to force what's called leakage. And you uh, now they're making steel and cement it up right across the border without regulations. And, then, and we're all impacted by the same CO2 emissions on this side of an imaginary line on a map. But now it's not regulated and all you've done was lost all the jobs. Do you know what I mean? And chemistry and the specialty and thermodynamics. Okay, that's, so one of the things we do at OCE is we manage that process to try to understand the science and, and the validity of it. The reality is, though, that because it's still 50% reimbursement-based funding, even at 50% in a finite, capitally constrained world, none of these companies are interested in doing a loser project. Yet the worst thing you can do as a company is to not only hurt yourself financially, but then to hurt the regulator who helped give you some money because then you'll never get it again, even in times of mourning. So, the, and especially when you consider that for cement and steel and lime, some of the biggest customers are the government. So they, uh, you don't, you don't cert you certainly don't want to hurt your biggest customer at the same time. So there's that, that knock-on effect, but in, in many other sectors that don't necessarily say have the government as a customer, um, <coughs> nobody's interested in, um, in spending money frivolously, even if it's only 50%. I mean, how many times have you gone into a store, seen something at 50% off, and still said, eh, I don't know if I really want that? Any questions? Martin, I have a quick question for you. Sure. Uh, when you compare carbon taxes mm -hmm. versus cap and trade program, which one proves to be more beneficial at the moment for Canada? If you have enough data to actually so you're, you're going to find a, a million arguments both ways. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, the answer is it depends. Okay, so a, a well-designed cap-and-trade program, um, in my mind, is better but far more complex to operate and run. Okay? A well-designed tax can work, but the price of carbon will be huge. So in order, so when you, with the way they try to compare systems, is they try to look at the ultimate benefit is to reduce greenhouse gases. So if you take a tax and it goes into general revenue and you decide, you know, you just want to put a price on carbon to make people less likely to, uh, to burn something that emits carbon. If, if the price point is that's the intent, it takes, uh, it takes about $300 a ton carbon tax to do the equivalent of the $18 a ton cap and trade. Okay, if, if the money is not going redirected back in, like if it's just done as a deterrent. So deterrent taxing, like what they did in British Columbia, is, um, is, is a very challenging aspect because it does have to be over $300 a ton. And so from, uh, from their perspective, it's about $30 a ton. So it's not where it needs to be to actually make a difference. 
Okay, so if you're taking the revenue from a tax and pumping it back in, then the tax levels would come down significantly. But then you you run the, the so you still run the risk of how do you deal with energy intensive trade exposed sectors. So you would have to give them a pass anyway. So if you start giving them a pass, then you start running the risk of well, what about me? Do you know what I mean? And so other people ask, why don't they get a pass? And so there has to be a certain amount of, um, I guess the, the, the cap and trade allows that uh, the general market to sort of take over as to where the price should be. And then the companies that are involved in it have access to the money that they paid into to get back to do projects. And I think from a multinational standpoint, um, the best way to keep a multinational in your, com in your country and in your province employing people is the cap and trade. If you go to a straight carbon tax, they move it to Mexico. 